Hey guys, hey everyone, thanks for joining us. All right. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the Emerging Practice Lecture Series. Um, this series was conceptualized by Mr. Jordan Chana, who just spoke, and it is hosted in collaboration with the Caribbean Architectural Students Association, or CASA for short. Um, so I'm going to allow Mr. Chana to give a brief synopsis about his ideas. Yeah and introduce um, the series to you guys. So, you know, this is the, the second conversation in our emerging practice lecture series. You know, we find ourselves in very unfortunate times where working and living have become very precarious and we're distancing ourselves from colleagues and loved ones. And this may have affected each and every one of you on your practice in its own way. So I hope we can take advantage of a new normal in a digital space to reach across the man-made boundaries and come together as a Caribbean community. Um, it's in that spirit that we introduced the Emerging Practice Lecture Series. It's a series that aims to give insight to students as well as practicing professionals about the realities of starting and maintaining an architectural practice. You know, each of our speakers in the series has a story that led them to start and motivates them to continue practicing architecture. Um, we also want to highlight their work as emerging voices in Caribbean architecture to the academic and professional community. And perhaps most importantly, we want to strengthen these networks across the Caribbean architectural community, regionally and globally as well, and, and start to build bridges between students and practitioners, between um, the academic and the professional community. Uh, so to conclude, the, the thesis for the series is that practicing architecture in the Caribbean comes with its unique challenges and even more so for young officers. How do young architects navigate these post-colonial regulatory environments and work with available resources to create meaningful work? Um, I'll pass it over to Bonita to introduce um, Steen Carrington. All right. So... Hi again, everyone. So our guest speaker for today is architect Steen Carrington. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Surveying and Land Information from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, um, his home country. He also holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Architectural Studies and a Master's of Architecture from the University of Technology, and that will be at the Caribbean School of Architecture. And since 2019, he has been the principal architect at Steen Carrington Architect Limited, a full service design consultancy based in Trinidad and Tobago. He's a registered architect with the Board of Architecture in Trinidad and Tobago, and also a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Institute of Architects. And he is a creative designer with a pragmatic vision of design and its implementation. And he will be sharing some of his projects and his work experience with us today. So thank you for being here. Um, you can take it away now. The floor is yours. Hey, hi guys. So thanks everyone for, uh, for coming on and I hope everyone is hearing me clearly. So yeah, I mean, I'll more or less share screen and, and begin, you know. Um, Well, I am the second installment of this um, initiative, which I really want to thank Jordan and Bonita for putting together. And I'll dive straight into it, right? So the journey for myself and, and the company, as you would have heard, I, I not going back to being born a baby, but you know, let's start with um, coming out of surveying and land information in 2008. So 2008, I got that and said to myself, you know, I really wanted to, to still be an architect, right? Um, that took me on a journey to start school in 2009 in Jamaica, right? Um, so I had, I, I had the ability to work in, um, in two of the larger or long-standing firms in Trinidad, Gillespie and Partners and NLBA for very short stints, things that were like less than, more or less summer vacations or interns and internships and that type of thing. And that was kind of scattered between 2010 and 2012. And 2013, I would have finished the bachelor 
in Jamaica and said to myself, okay, let's go really do this and finish it. And, um, and that took me into the masters. Um, through that time, we had study tours, you know, that we took study tours to Antigua, to, to Georgetown, Guyana. And then for the masters, I did um, New Orleans, which was quite a, um, quite a nice experience. Um, but in between that, I worked at G-Cell Designs. That's where I really um, started that more professional realm of, of starting to learn. And um, after completing that master's, sort of joined G-Cell Designs full time, which is um, all these practices, of course, located in Trinidad. And um, began that registration process, um, I think probably late 2017. Uh, so by 2018, I would have been registered um, with the board. And out of that time into 2019, I would have become the first associate director that the firm would have ever had. Um, and, um, you know, everything was kind of in flux. You know, the, the country has always been sort of moving through and, and up and down through times that feel like recession and and. and always this sort of flux, right? Still standing that I was able to be made the associate director and um, we were shaping up for a okay, you know, okay and promising things. But then I, you know, quite, quite important shift took place, um, you know, where I had some health challenges and I think it made me want to take leaps, right? So here in the middle of 2019, I said to myself, I think I really want to do this. And um, originally thought I'd just do some freelance work, but felt more committed to starting an official practice. So went ahead and did all the things that required to do that. And by the end of August, I was renovating a room to in the house to become an office, right? So 20, 2019, September, I'm fully practicing and we've got a few jobs come up, came on. And I'm running by myself. And in a matter of a few months, I recognize that I need help. And Kevin Spence graciously accepts an offer. We start running again. And between then and now, Jonathan Williams, um, both of them um, out of the Caribbean School of Architecture have been working with me. And um, you know, we forge ahead. So that's, that's the timeline um, of, of that professional journey, I would call it. I mean, of course, if you want to read more about me, we could have a chat, right? Um, so this is the team. The team is myself, um, and I act as the managing director and you know, lead on design. Jonathan is our senior design associate. He has his bachelor and master's, and would essentially soon join to um, to become a full time, a full on graduate architect and start his PPC um, soon enough. Uh, and then we have Kevin Spencer, design associate, who has his bachelor and his master's in construction management. Um, and, and he also has his portions of projects as well. And then also in the company is um, my sister who is an attorney um, and she acts as director. And then you know, my mother actually helps with, as office manager. So whenever we need to call people for payment, <laughs> all these things are part of it. So our work, you know, let's go into a sort of brief understanding of how I view and how we view architecture. So we, are, we consider architecture and design as a benefit to life. We view each project as an opportunity to achieve a balance of beautiful design and practical applications of cost and time, you know, very important. We believe in the rigor of design as well as a sensible implementation of construction methods, available material and skills, budgets, client inputs. Architects occupy essential space in society, and this should translate to all clients. The complex needs of a project's conception to execution are a specific set of skills developed by an architect over an extended years of education and professional practice. This is important because I think this, is, this last paragraph really speaks to how the architect should continuously be reminded, and not in an ego-driven way, but really in a sensitive and responsible way and be able to share that role um, with society. I feel like we are among the very few 
that have the capacity to get into projects and solve them and present solutions. No other person in the construction sector can do it. And I don't think any other training and educational process allows persons to do that. So just wanted to let you know that's all, that's part of how we think. So just kind of quick overview. I mean, I wouldn't show something like my company profile, but this kind of encapsulates the projects that we've sort of been on. Um, one, at, one label one is some duplexes in an area called Santa Cruz. And um, that's in their con finished construction on that project. Um, project two is in the approval stage. Project three is in design development, which is like about, uh, by the way, the first one is 30 duplexes. Second one is 39 apartments in a building. The other one is 10, 10 housing models. Project four is uh, 64 apartments, part of the duplex project. Um, that's in approval as well. As well. Project five is um, 72 luxury apartments that uh, are near completion now. Um, they probably should be at um, practical completion. They were practical completion a few days ago and should be fully for handover for the end of the year. Project six is a unique one because it looks like a house with really two apartments. Um, and project seven are actual duplex homes that are single level and for low income. Um, so yeah, that's project seven, yeah. These are all projects again at different stages. Um, project one, the client is uncertain of how to move ahead. Project two is almost it's halfway through construction. Project three is a complete project in Tobago. Um, four is another project in design development in Tobago. Five is a project on a very steep slope that's sort of early in design development and the client had to pause because of COVID. And then project Six is one we just received um, a building permit for today. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, these are our mixed use and commercial portfolio. Um, one is one that we just began in design development, which is um, it's actually a gym with two apartments on the upper level in Tobago. Two is a dental office in, San, in South Trinidad. And um, it's a renovation actually, and we try to bring in that, that entire thing back. Um, project three is one that was abandoned, but it was supposed to be a warehouse and office building in the aviation space. Um, project four is a, a project that we'd actually look at, which is um, commercial space in Tobago. Five is a credit union corporate um, space as well as office rental, which is in, approval as well, early approval stages. And five, six is a renovation in um, Woodbrook, Trinidad. It sort of takes the old house and tries to bring it back into, bring it to the future. These are series of civic and unbuilt work. Um, one being a, um, a major tender that we went in with one of the larger contractors in the country. Um, you know, it's really a price ranking thing that people will also learn about as they start to practice. But this project came in fifth out of the ranking of cost. Um, there's no other <laughs> ranking in Trinidad and Tobago. But one and two reflect that project that we offered as, as, a, as a team effort with a full um, tender team. Three and four reflect a community center that we're still waiting on a response from. Five is a restoration of a fire station that we also um, went the cheapest. <laughs> and, um, and then six, we, um, we were told that somebody else won that as well. Um, so with that, we, let's dive into the two projects that I decided to, to bring to you guys. And I hope that um, you know, you're excited to hear about them. All right, so this project in, in Tobago is, uh, we, we got a, a client that's a, contractor, they sort of turn in, turn in developer, and um, they had a 25 by 11 meter foundation on a, on, a, on a 1900 square meter site. The back of this building faces the sea, which is quite lovely. But we, had, we were confined to that area of, of a slab and we were told, you know, do magic, right? 
So we're like, fine, okay, well, what you guys need, they needed a commercial space that would move, that would be a green grocer. And they said, we need as much space for the office as possible and we want to see the sea, right? So those are the views to the sea um, and the circle represents where the site is. It's quite pretty close. Um, you're looking at less than three kilometers or so to the sea. When we look at the site, we found that here was a street access and that's where the slab sat. So we, placed, we, we, we ensure that the building functioned well in that way. We created um, four parking spaces that would allow easy use of that commercial. And then we created a bigger space to come to the back where you'd have all the parking for staff, um, visitors spill off for, the, for the, um, that grocer. And then they would also be taking in a lot of material in a loading, in a loading, loading yard, because as I said, this is corporate headquarters for this type of building. The ground floor, we looked at structure and how that structure worked and how we can integrate, not, not to use what we were given to sort of formalize a, um, a brief. And what you would see is that in the green grocer, we have two areas that are satisfied plumbing. And then as we move into the commercial outfit, we still try to maintain plumbing and so on against the um, south wall. And then a similar thing on the upper level, while still having these office spaces in terms of the hierarchy of the functions of spaces with these views towards the sea. So even though we still loaded a number of these things along the back wall, we still had to create elevations that would, um, that would speak to good design and to the overall um, beauty of the site. And then that upper level, which is um, that roof terrace, they wanted a space to entertain. And therefore, we just had these simple, you know, bathroom and ki kitchen sort of outdoor facilities um, and an open space. Additionally, I think on this part of the slab, we were also considering having um, water storage. So that does help um, find a way to sort of contain everything that this building needs um, within it. Again, a quick shot of this section and how those views towards the sea work from those two levels above. Yeah, and then these would be the um, some of some just some views of it. Um, the, co the company has uh, yellow and and red as part of their branding, so they wanted to use more. We tried to sort of temper it in a way that allowed us to have quite beautiful elevation on the street side. We gave them this bold um, elevator uh, in red because their colors are red and yellow, as I said. And then we did a subtle yellow on the inside that is like, okay, well, we do the furniture. I'm not sure what they're going to do yet, but, but that's how we um, tried to interpret things, still make it feel like it was meaningful um, um, while allowing our design sensitivity of this sort of um, tropical minimalist that we try to. We try to carry forward in our projects. Um, as one of the things I mentioned earlier up is that client input is, is part of our process. So we don't try to overpower our client. We try to steer them in a way that um, still allows us to execute um, good looking work. Um, so even though, again, what you'll see here is that even though this is the back of the building, we have quite large apertures um, from the office areas that one, it allows the management of the company to interact with the operations that take, part, part, take place on the back of the property and have those views um, towards the, the, the sea, the ocean. Uh, just some shots of where the progress is at. And that's the reason why I wanted to show this one is because they're at, this is about a week and a half ago, and they're at, um, in the colored images, show that they're at first, first floor slab a lot of the um, reinforcement in place. And a quick note is that um, very, the, the contract is quite experienced so that there was a lot of, um, making sure nobody's not seeing anything. Oh, everybody can see great, yeah. Yeah, so the, the contract is quite experienced so that they had a lot of damage to the rebar that was exposed because it was exposed for years. I'm not even 100% sure. So they actually had to cut the tops of the columns 
and, and then redouble in and they'll be actually casting new formwork to come up to ensure the, um, the building's integrity. Yeah, so that is this project, right? So project two, um, which is sort of our um, recent, I guess, flagship project that we have. I mean, we have other towers that we've been working on, but things are different stages. We can't disclose some stuff, but this one we can. And um, it's in um, the approval process now. Um, Oh okay, yeah, quick note on the other one is that it actually was so long ago that that building actually had an approval. So all we had to do is conform to a basic type of, um, of adherence to those approvals. Um, but this one is in approval right now. It's 39, uh, of 39 units with uh, 26 two bedrooms and 13 three bedrooms over seven levels. Um, it's in Champlain, which is sort of still kind of northeastish Trinidad, um, al along the East Trinidad, sorry, along the main thoroughfare, the East West Corridor. So this would be that East West main road uh, and that has the main road and the priority bus route, which is like a designated lane for buses in Trinidad. And then a little bit south of that is our main highway, the Churchill Roosevelt Highway. And this is the, the major, most major intersection in the country. So the site being all north of there, it's like really at this hub. And um, so it's a quite exciting project. Um, the site has expansive views sort of south, um, south of the, prop the property through a valley, which is quite interesting. Um, and this is like a closer in context. So after we've come off the main street, there's a topography that you have, you'll be climbing up, right? So it's a quite narrow street. This is the site. And what you'd recognize is that the site has an existing building on it, quite an old warehouse looking thing at the base of it. Quite a bit in shambles, right? And there's people living here right now, but the whole goal is to take this entire project up a notch and um, tie it in with some towers that are unfinished, but quite tall towers that are here. Project actually, this project got, actually got hung, which is the projects to the, to the west of this building. And um, so you're going to be coming up that street, as I said, mentioned, quite a narrow street, get to that entry. Our plan, as you see in the next slide, um, is that we carry the entry further up north of it. What that allows us to do is use this site to the maximum ability. What we show on the, on the right is the fact that this property actually had an encroachment in all forms. So there's an encroachment of the main road onto the property edge to the east. Um, the, the building that was built was, is encroaching and um, this, this sort of parabolic shape to the left, just to the west, actually um, functions as parking right now, which again is it's outside of the designated site. So we had to sort of bring everything back into and mold it into shape, right? And we began looking at this project and saying, okay, what, what would the num number of units that these, these clients want and the cost to build and all that type of things. And it took us to saying, okay, well, this, if we wanna park on grade and you wanna see how much units you can get, but this is what it is, it's a four story building. It sits on grade um, and then we park on, on, on two levels that we've created by um, finding the best fit in the topography as the site sort of traverses over about um, six meters from the uppermost part all the way to this corner here where there's an existing retaining wall. The client came back and said, no, I think we need more units. So to do that, we had to swipe that out and then we have to bring this new form in and pop the building up, which allows us to then fit parking on, 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 on grade. And by doing that, we're able to get much more units. So that right now, this site sits at like sort of this sort of optimum thing. So it's, it's working as best as, as we believe it's possible. We then move into how do we start rationalizing each floor um, in a way that allows this parking to work with the structure because this is um, formwork, which is an imported system. Of, of aluminum panels and we need to transfer that load with 
you know, feedback from the structural engineers, um, transfer that load accordingly down to these walls in the basement levels. And um, a unique part of this project is that we have um, accessible units on what would be first floor. So ground floor just has parking and some service and support areas, pumping, pump and water storage, and, um, and which would be the pool that's above um, as well. And that was quite a, quite a demanding thing. We had a back and forth with the client about how do we insert a pool when the space was quite tight already. But, um, you know, myself and Jonathan and did a quite a brilliant job and you'd see any renderings how, how that was executed. So these three ground floor levels, the three, four ground floor level units, sorry, um, give us two, two bedrooms and a three bedroom that, that have accessible accessible for the different be able. And when I mentioned about the structure, that's more or less the grid that just carries all the way, all the way up and, and makes this building stand. And what I hinted, what I'm hinting to here is where we try to load all our plumbing. Um, so all of these areas represent where is wet in the building, um, which would be kitchen, laundry, and the, the um, bathroom facilities. The two bedrooms have two bathrooms, and the three bedrooms also have two bathrooms, but it's a larger bathroom and closet in the master, which is one of the stronger selling points. And then the roof level um, actually is accessed through the lobby, but the uppermost units um, have access to that, that, um, that level. So they get the roof terrace to themselves, as opposed to a communal roof terrace. So, I mean, everything in, in development is, is quite you know, money driven. So that's what I mean, it's added, added benefits and upsales. And then I mentioned the structures similar as we showed on the previous floor. And then this is the in section, what we would discuss, uh, discuss about the opportunity of raising the building means that parking is now um, not quite double, but a significant amount is gained by doing that. And then these are the levels. And that's what I mentioned by the yellow color. It shows that, that those uppermost units hold um, the roof terrace as an asset. And then everything to the right, which is, has more of that expansive view that we mentioned very early. Um, and everything else to the west is much more against the hillside. And as I mentioned also, is that having the building lifted like this, persons who would park at that upper level, so level parking level two, they wheel themselves into a unit that has um, a balcony, which is not quite common. So it's an unconventional aspect of the design. Um, and we felt it would have been a nice um, sell point. And uh, these are the pictures of the, of it in, uh, you know, the renderings of it in all its glory. Um, yeah, so just a few more overhead. The approach coming up the hill. This is what um, you'd see emergency access there on the left, that central space on the inside. And the corridor is also a naturally ventilated corridor. So the qualities of lobby and so on are not typical of actually like air conditioning in the entire circulation space. This would be the vehicular entry side. Um, and then this is an experience of that pool deck area where we at least have some areas for them to have um, you know, bathrooms and that type of thing and a little deck. And so I'm trying to make the most of an area that's quite um, confined. So yes, I told you all I will be quick. So I wanted to have this as a engaging conversation. So I'm leaving this last 25 minutes for you all to ask things about the projects, things about what practice is like, race, age, and gender, what's like in Trinidad. Yeah, so I'm seeing a question from Jessica. 
And hello, you tell me your name when you speak, I'm sure. I, I, unless Jordan, you're gonna handle that. Um, yeah, Jessica Gemma um, has a question. Jessica, if we could unmute. Oh, let me let me check. Try again, Jessica. Jessica, can you try on mute again? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. You hear me clearly? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, so first off, thank you so much, Mr. Cranton. Such a beautiful presentation. My question um, is a general one. You know, mm -hmm. as a fourth year student in all of our projects, we were told about sustainability. I'd just like to know how you approach sustainability with your um, designs that you've presented. Well, I mean, what I would say is that sustainability needs to be something that the client offers. I'm sorry that the, the architect offers, but the client has to accept, right? Um, this client, interestingly, has the, um, the willingness to use um, things that can drive either benefit to them financially or transfer benefits to a homeowner. So we looked at um, EV, it wouldn't necessarily be sustainable, but it's definitely moving forward in a green way. So we have electric vehicle charging will be one of the things that we're gonna to try to institute. Um, we're trying to use solar um, lighting for common services, which is sort of a new way that projects I'm trying to move forward with, which reduces the cost to the homeowners when they transfer into operation. Um, some of the other things that we looked at is that the efficiency of the building is also going to be a measure of that sustainability. So that whole idea of having those, that plumbing and so on quite linear, it gives us the opportunity to say, if we were to have to, um, to, to capture water, we even have ways that rainwater is captured and everything in a quite um, central manner. So um, I would say that solar, in, and there's possibility of doing solar water heating um, on, the, on the roof level as well. Um, again, that could be a transfer cost to reducing um, person's energy, but then it's quite difficult to get enough to heat all 39 units. So it's always this sort of back and forth dialogue about how efficient is this thing going to work? And if it's not working, um, if it's not working efficiently, then we necessarily can't implement it as well as we'd like to. So solar is important. We, we're using it for lighting. Um, the efficiency of the building by itself, we're trying to optimize that. Um, paved areas, we're trying to reduce as much as that as possible and use grass, grass pavers just to help with percolation. And um, yes, and then electric vehicle charging uh, and so sort. Yeah, all right. Great. Um, Jessica, you have a follow-up question? Or did that answer your question? I think that's something that we could probably also ensure that the questions are answered as well. Yes, you did touch on answering the question a bit. Um, you made a point about, yes, you'd want to present sustainable features, but will the client be able to fund it? Um, exactly. Is there a chance? Is there a chance that or a possibility to look into the ways of making it more affordable? Because while the idea is a fun one, a practical one, um, if everyone says they can't afford it, then sustainability is now a thing of a thought and no longer attainable. Well, if you, if you mean, understand what I'm saying. No, yeah, but Jessica, I mean, when I, these are the things that are sometimes even bigger than, than, than the architect. So we have to look at, a, at the balance, right? So there's the cost of the products that are instituted to make things more sustainable. And then there are things that we can do through design. Um, so for instance, the cooling method for this project, we're trying to have a type of VRF system that is one condenser that cools the entire, the entire um, unit because it's a sales strategy to ensure that persons want 
um, a space because it's air conditioned. We're trying to reduce that as the to have a tons of air conditioning units emitting all the um the the fumes that that, that they may have through leakages and that type of thing. So it's when you when in, in, in particular parts of operate of practice, we have we have to consistently look at how do we make a project viable while still creating good architecture, responsible architecture? Um, you know, it's it's really it's truly symbiotic, right? And, and, and all the synergies are needed. So it's not because I didn't want to put more. For instance, we could have tried to make the building um, work without air conditioning, which is what we did quite a bit by having none of the air, the corridors um, with air conditioning. So we made all of those naturally ventilated. So the the the, the cruciform strategy of having the um, the circulation work meant that there's always airflow through. So we're doing it, probably not recognize that we're doing it with every stroke that we take, but, um, but we're trying, you know, and once we can make a position that the sustainability practice actually helps reduce our costs, then it's beneficial. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great, that was a great, great question, Jessica. Um, M. McFarling, have your hand raised? Feel free to unmute. Which which McFarling is gracing us with his present? <laughs> I'm not M. Matthew, maybe Matthew McFarling. Matthew, can you hear it? Is there a question in the chat? He's still sure saying not allowed. He said to say not allowed still. Mm. Let me. How about now, Matthew? I lock Matthew out. And now he's on. He's on. Yeah. Hey, uh, hi, everyone. Um, Matthew Mark Farlin here from Jamaica. Um, Steen Housings. Um, good man. Good, good, okay. good. Yeah. So, two questions I have for you. Yeah. Um, one is what's the current culture for development now? Um, mm -hmm. Example, like for us, in recent years, we've had you know a lot of changes in our approach to development. You know, we've seen um, things like a SEZ Act, which has promoted the development of things like the BPO sector, um, enforcement of the building code, which has had the fire department being a lot more involved. And uh, you know, through the Ministry of Economic Growth, we've seen you know NEPA having a stronger stance in managing developments you know like planning um planning regulations environmental impact you know parking and stuff you know um has anything like that happened in trinidad recently that has stimulated or changed how development you know has or will you know yeah, take place what, what, when you said bpo what are those again um we, for us it's call centers but it's 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 um, business process outsourcing services. Ah, okay, um, okay. All right, all right. Got you, got yeah. you. So that, that is a, almost like, well, initially, so a few years ago, um, the Ministry of Trade, they tried to use some foreign direct investment opportunities to get a company called ICOR, which does essentially as a base for, um, what do you call it, like customer service. Like that is a commercial building exclusively for that. And therefore projects like that became incentive projects to developers. So they were like, boom, we need a call center. We need a space to do some light manufacturing. And it becomes the, out I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but it's actually, that's a business processing and outsourcing facility. So therefore, if there's an opportunity to create buildings like that, it's, it takes persons who have land in good locations and some form of capital and ability to pay it back to, to run ahead with that that has not happened again. So there was no specific incentive for that. The next incentive that happened was recently is out of the pandemic, 
the government is like, well, we have no money. We have to pay persons to carry, to, to support persons who weren't employed. So they said, all landowners, developers, uh, contractors, go build housing. And if, if, you, if your housing is in a good price range, we're gonna send persons to, to um, take it through um, what we have as HDC, which is, which is NHT for Jamaica. And um, uh, NHT, no, it was a national housing, yeah, NHT, right? Yeah. And, and what that has done is has driven some work for my practice, but at the same time, my, my developers are also trying to get to better price units because they'll make more profit. They recognize that even by doing that, they had to adjust their policy for, for height and density. So Jamaica has this habitable rooms um, count, which, which, you know, simple example says that for habitable rooms, you have a three bedroom unit. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm talking to planners locally saying, listen, you don't need to get past this unit count because the unit meant it could have been a studio, a two or three or four bedroom. So that's nonsense. Same time, they issue a new policy that talks about bedroom count, which puts us in a more clear, rational um, understanding, even than the habitable room, because not everybody's going to understand habitable room, but they're going to understand bedrooms. And that means that we're now designing better mixed use, let's say, sorry, mixed scale usages for residential. So now we have the opportunity to say we can have a, which is what my project does um, as it stands now is that it mixes the two bedroom and three bedrooms. And the policy also said you can start to increase the density. That's a consistent dialogue. Um, okay. you know, how many things can you satisfy? And all of those things are sort of happening at the same time. So the, the incentives are not often very robust. They, they often need jerk. And it's very similar to the reason why we don't have a building code in Trinidad. So there's a small building code that was never properly ratified. It's not in a legislation, but there's a document like by Bureau of Standards type of thing. Um, but there's not a national billing code that has um, incorporated that. And I, and I do recall a, a, a thing that you did, Matthew, which speaks about the fact that when you take on the international building code and they, and they augment standards, are the local artisans, trade persons, or even the wealthy contractors, are they going to even want to adapt these higher standards? So it's all this sort of movement of, of things that are happening at the same time. And um, we hope that by our structural engineers holding to, uh, holding to IBC and, and, and whatever UK codes, and us as architects trying to use materials that, that, that adhere to at least good test criteria that the building quality still moves forward in a sensible way. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. I mean, I did. I did figure that there was some, you know, some change that has created some stimulus for for development. You know, it, I mean, it seems to be some parallel, you know, between you guys and in Jamaica. So, you know, thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And and I'm seeing a question from um, Mark Raymond here. I'm just checking the chat at the same time. Sure. So Mark Raymond has really been one of the mentor architects in Trinidad for the past, I would say, 15 to 20 years. Um, he was actually the facilitator of the PPC up until his departure, and he now works out of um, South Africa in their graduate school of design um, as he had a school. And then, of, of course, he does a lot of lecturing at different levels throughout the globe. Um, so he's asking a question about my involvement in the TTIA. And well, now I'm on the, on the Green Building um, Council, actually. So that was another thing that I just took up recently. So because I've been involved in the TTIA, um, it has allowed me to try to work simultaneously with different initiatives to move things along because we really need consistent support by every level of architect that comes into the fraternity or the community, I should say. And from the time I, I got registered, I jumped on the executive and we have tried different pro um, projects. Um, of course, all things being hampered by, by the pandemic, but prior to that, we had something that was quite nice that we were trying to use to spirit the turnover of everybody and get people interested was a award ceremony and we made it into quite a nice um, event. And everybody was quite driven by that. Uh, and then the pandemic happened and sort of 
kind of made people apathy rise again. But what my participation has been recently is taking um, something, or we have a joint consultative um, consortium, which takes all the persons in the, um, all the member bodies of the construction industry, the engineers, the architects, the planners. And as we speak right now, we're actually looking at a document that ties in with the question Matt, you asked about policy. So the town and country division issued a policy document. We found that it could have been a little bit better. So we went through and really analyzed everything that we could to speak to how they are addressing and seeing things. Because we always contend with things about the value of land, the actual usable floor plate, the setbacks, um, could we park more levels and therefore increase density? Could we um, try to reduce the sprawl in certain areas? Give more green spaces back by increasing the density and, 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 and height. So, so that's something that, that I'm actively involved in, even though I'm not, I'm not on the executive anymore. I'm now kind of doing work on committees and subcommittees. And um, yeah, so that's, that's one. And yeah, um, what else? Yeah, green building thing is something that we I'm new to, so we're now trying to see how we can um, get that to to be elevated and and take on projects that are um, get towards getting people lead accredited and looking at other green green um, accredited programs and so on. So that's tying in Matthews into Mark Raymond's question. Great! Shout out to Mark Raymond for joining the conversation. Um, <laughs> I want to I want to turn it over to um, a student now, um, Chris Ann Campbell. You have your hand raised. Hi, Mr. Carrington. Thank you so much for the presentation. I yeah, don't really yeah, have a, I don't, no problem. I don't really have a question. I just have. Um, I was gonna say, what advice would you give a uh, fourth year student about to graduate next year that wants to like enter the field for work experience before doing masters? Um, what is good advice? Um, so fourth year. I think one of the important things that you want to do is, and I mean, I don't think it's ever gonna get old. You have to be willing to learn how everything that you got while in, in school how does that manifest into a real scenario? So even if it takes somebody, be, we, let me put it this way, what would be quite lovely is that sometimes architecture offices can't take on very small projects, right? Maybe somebody who wants to do a renovation or a two bedroom house or you know something like that. If you can get that type of client and tell an architect, listen, you don't need to take it on I just want your space and your advice to learn on this. So if that's possible, right? And what that does for you is that you know task with understanding how everything comes together. So you would have done a nice big building in fourth year with all the bells and whistles, but you probably don't know how that works, right? And what getting in at that granular level at even at that small scale, it will start to allow you to understand how does the height of a brick and the lentil work with the beams, you know, where is the, the, the insulation in relation to the ceiling structure? Um, where do we source windows and doors? What's the quality of these things? Um, how do you relate to a contractor? Understanding what prices are. And you see, the more that you get that, now you, you, know, you start integrating into an architecture office as you move forward. And in whatever form of practice that may come to you, but you start understanding the space and the culture in which you live in. That's quite important. That's just a practical thing about getting into work. I mean, of course, there's, there's the lovely things about, about, about big, big designs and big projects and so on that will come as well, but that's what I would give to anybody that is just out of the year for time. Great advice, Steve. Um, uh, turn to us another student, uh, Gianna. You have your hand raised. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, Mr. Carrington. Thank you for your presentation. Um, 
I have a question about like what is your like opinion on what the architect like what what is your your opinion of the architect's role in revitalizing cities or in the Caribbean context I mean I'm thinking about Port of Spain because that's where I'm from but okay like from the wider Caribbean what do you think and also what is your opinion on how it should like develop do you think we should build on what's there or start anew oh shout out to Mr. Taylor it's really cool that you're here <laughs> sorry cool, cool, cool. yeah okay so so thanks Jan, for the question um so architects and planners fundamentally need to con and consistently be involved in the decisions and, and that was part of one of those things I mentioned the architect um, has that the, the education tools and experience to be the best person to solve design problems, right? So we should, what, whatever it is, we should be part of the discussion, even if somebody doesn't like our ideas. Um, and therefore, it, this impacts why I'm going to say this. To, to rebuild something or to build somewhere else means that somewhere be, becomes forgotten. So you, there, there would have to be a consistent overlap of how things go forward. So a perfect example would be that, that visit that I had to New Orleans, where the French Quarter is, is a lovely mix of entertainment and some residential on the outskirts, um, but it remains at a particular scale and it, it has this relationship, but it grew at the edges again, and some edges to that very high commercial um, buildings. So I don't think that Port of Spain should grow beyond um, a bus, a, a, a simple bus or walking network, net, network of, 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 of distance, because then that creates too much disconnect. And Jamaica dealt with it in, in the New Kingston um, downtown relationship of expansion. And you don't necessarily want to create a whole new city because we don't want a complete decay of, of the existing one. So it's ways of making projects that, that are holistic and looks at the, the city as a master plan and a city that's quite unique in its, in its, in its squares that there's, there's a number of green spaces that are in, um, if you look at um, Port of Spain and Woodbrook as a map, they're quite lovely squares that are not used well. Um, you know, in, in other countries, these squares would be, you know, these real heartbeat spaces and you have active commercial spaces on these edges. Um, our squares are quite empty and underutilized and the edges are all caged off. Um, so th th those are my views. My views are that we must be involved. Secondly, we should, we can build new, but we have to have a balance of how we, we deal with the old and not create decay um, and, and sort of a forgottenness of, of what exists. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, just some quick context. Right now, Jamaica is embarking on a next city, but you oh. know, to your point, Spain, um, wow. I think really focusing on like, you know, what we have existing and like making that work and unlocking its potential is really exactly. Yeah. I mean, something even if you need to shut, even if you need to shut one street down to execute something that is going to be valuable for twenty five years, there's no reason why that can't be done. You know, so they, they, this sort of dismissal of, of what is there um, to move somewhere else. Um, to me, it's because you see, if they go somewhere else, you're gonna still, you're gonna lose that business on the street. So if you can't take a year of, of, of reduced business, if you have, to, if you have to, um, to, to inconvenience a street for some form of development, you may build somewhere else and create a long-term forgot, to, um, if, um, you know, sort of eradication of your business. Um, by doing that. So it's a consistent reminder of how do we interpret these, these large questions and, and not just dismiss them um, and move somewhere else. But yeah, that's my thoughts. De definitely, the city has a process. Okay, yeah. we're, we're coming up to time. It's so hard to get all these questions in, in just this hour. Um, I'm going to open it up for two more questions. I saw Doreen dunk on her hand up. Um, and then one more question from Bonita. 
I think we'll we'll wrap up after that. Um, Doreen. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Doreen. I'm, I'm here. You're fine. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so I think this is kind of related to um, the question that Jessica had asked first. But so the latest climate predictions state that for the Caribbean, the biggest issues that we're all going to be seeing um, is drought, is water shortages throughout the entire country. So of course, that is obviously affecting agriculture, but also affecting urban development and, and urban um, growth. So I'm I'm curious as a you know as a designer as an architect, what are some of the design um, kind of innovations and, and, and tools that you're thinking about that are going to help us get through and adapt to the changing society? Okay, well, my my um. So every time that there are questions about where Trinidad and Tobago or the Caribbean stands, there's I don't know if you all know, but I find myself always asking the question about what did Singapore do to get things right, right? Singapore's history is that they were, they, they more or less became independent and formalized their, their governance and so on along a very similar time, 1960s. And it was a forgotten piece of land, right? And then somehow they were able to figure out a lot of things. Right now, what they're doing is urban farming in, um, in, in, in the CBD. So in, in, in quite city type spaces um, or suburban at minimum is that, um, I'm at maximum, sorry. They're creating stack farming. What that does now is deal with that, that issue of drought and how do you regulate um, pests, um, temperatures, um, regulating the use of water into, into stack methods of irrigation. And it, well, it's also a number of things, right? Rwanda has taken initiative to uh, model a lot of their growth and, and successes on, um, on, on Singapore's deceased um, leader, but ready who that person who put everything into, into and you all could all read up on, on Singapore. In, in your own time and it's and, and it's positive effects on Rwanda um, and their separate leaders that's going to be a good interesting thing for you to look up on but I say those things to, to indicate that we all fall into a similar timeline in the Caribbean and we will have no choice but to act and find innovative ways of dealing with things that um, once seemed difficult we were an arable society and we agrarian and we had lots of farms and we all don't need to know the history the far 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 history of, of farming and how we helped other countries do well but we um but we have to look at it in a responsible way for how we reduce our levels of import and how architecture can aid in that whether it's at an on grade type of green green field with um with, with green houses and so on or do we have to increase the density of our agriculture as well so those are my points for the reading on Singapore and they're working in, um, in, in dense farming con conditions, um, as well as the recognition that we have to innovate um, to, to help supplement our agricultural needs. Great. Thanks, Dean. Um, so to close off, just ask Bunny to ask her question and um, we'll say some closing remarks and you know, I'm sure everyone's busy with their day um, so we can you know, move on to what's next. Okay, Bonita. Is Bonita in the house? I think Bonita. Uh, I think her wife and my son tripped out again. Yeah, she just dropped out. Okay, well. With that said, um, thank you so much, Dean, for for joining us today. I know, um, you know, I've been talking to you. I know you're, you know, taking meticulous care in constructing this presentation. <laughs> uh, definitely, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day um, to, you know, talk about your process, the story, and kind of go through, um, you know, your 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 life as an architect in Trinidad. A lot of 
a, a high cost, a high number of um, projects in such a short time of doing business. Um, yeah, yeah, we we try and boy, <laughs> we are. Really, Jonathan, are, and, um, Jonathan and Kevin are like uh, you know are with me like soldiers, you know. We really yeah, hunker yeah. down. We're doing, we're doing work, huh? That's that's really staying focused. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Um. Thanks again for being here. Thanks everyone for being a part of this conversation. Really want to highlight um Caribbean architects and the work that they're doing, especially young architects that are um you know developing this idea of a practice in the context that they're in. Um. Yes. I will hope to create these connections between students and practicing architects. Maybe yes. some internships across boundaries in the future. I don't know. Um, but thank you so much, team. Sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. We just have to hope. We're hoping that out of the pandemic, as, as things move forward um, globally and, um, and locally, that there is more confidence, there is more understanding of how we go forward. Um, and I think once persons are confident and feel safe, things begin to happen. Um, that's, that, that's, the, that's the story of the economy, it's the story of, of society, it's the story of culture, right? So my best to everybody in, in, in the school and, um, and in your studios and, and classes and in your quest to become uh, architects. Thanks, Dean. Um, keep in mind that um, the final conversation in this series is happening on November 4th with Hugo Matthews from Jamaica, um, Principal Architect of Virtuoso Architects. Um, stay tuned. We'll be opening up registration um, next week. Um, we hope to see you all there. Um, thanks for joining. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.